Hi, good morning, Bridgewater Rainham. This is Ryan Powers, Assistant Superintendent of Schools. On behalf of our superintendent, Derek Swenson, I wanted to take this opportunity to provide you some updates on the planning process for the reopening of schools in the fall. I am going to uh, be sharing my screen with you this morning, walking you through uh, some information on a PowerPoint, and then uh, we'll come back together at the end. So give me one second to share my screen. Okay, here we go. So what, we, what I hope to cover this morning, obviously, is to give you some uh, information on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's initial fall reopening guidance. I do say initial because we have been told that uh, this guidance could change at any moment and also uh, be expanded or reduced. And we should have some final guidance sometime in August from the commissioner and the department. So that's why I'm referring to this as the initial fall reopening guidance. I do want to take some time to share with you some of the milestones that we've accomplished to date, give you a little information from the health office, uh, talk to you about the three possible scenarios for the fall, which include also doing our building and classroom assessments and sharing some pros and cons about each one of those scenarios, and then to talk to you also about next steps. So as you know, on June 25th, Commissioner Riley from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education released that initial guidance with the priority of getting students back into school. The main focus is getting all students back in person, uh, obviously while keeping you know health and safety at the forefront. And so we've been charged with that task. How can we safely reopen schools in the fall? And so we've had a series of steps that we've had to go through uh, and uh, which I'll be sharing with you uh, as we go through this PowerPoint. But really what we had to do was each district had to go ahead and uh, examine the three possible models and really plan for each one. So the first model is a full in-person return to school with modifications, which I'll talk about. A hybrid model where some students would be at home, some students would be in school, and then after a period of time they would switch or fully remote. If for some reason that uh, COVID-19, we see a resurgence or a spike again, and we need to go fully remote, much like we did in the spring, we also have to explore that option. Uh, obviously, in addition to just looking at those three models, we really need to make sure that uh, we're able to schedule our buildings safely and that we are meeting all of our instructional requirements, our time on learning requirements, uh, and making sure that we're providing a, a, a strong educational foundation for our students, regardless of what model we're in. The one thing that I will say is that we have to be prepared at any moment to move between these models. And I say that because if you think back to the springtime, uh, we left the school on a Friday uh, with all intentions of returning on Monday. Uh, however, that decision was made for uh, late Friday afternoon uh, that it was not safe to return to school. And so we need to be prepared. We always use the example that if we leave, uh, much like in the spring, we leave on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, and, and for some reason, a decision is made Tuesday night. We need to be able to transition right away, uh, either into a hybrid model, a fully remote model, or back the other way. If we're already fully remote or we're in a hybrid, uh, and then all of a sudden we have clearance to come back, uh, we need to be able to do, do that as well. So some of the milestones to date, uh, we've done a space assessment in each one of our buildings based on the DESE guidance, which again, I'll share with you. Uh, we've been very proactive in terms of looking at uh, scheduling and protocols for various points of the day, such as arrival and dismissal, uh, what lunch will look like, hallway traffic, uh, stairwell traffic, et cetera. Uh, because, you know, we're, we're looking at things like, do we need to go to one-way hallways? Uh, if the hallway is not wide enough, if we can have, uh, you know, traffic passing safely, uh, then obviously we wouldn't have to, but those are all things that we're looking at. Uh, we obviously wanna make sure that we have, you know, strong, clear procedures in place for our staff and student, uh, staff and students uh, for their safety, including how are they going to access the nurse if they're not feeling well, and what type of spaces have we created for those that are symptomatic. Um, obviously our director of facilities, has uh, developed and is still developing a comprehensive cleaning plan uh, for all of our buildings on a daily basis and also working uh, with our nursing leader uh, to provide PPE equipment for all of our uh, staff at various levels. Um, so from May uh, to now, uh, we've met an administrative team at least twice per week. Uh, and then also on Tuesdays, uh, beginning uh, late May, uh, we have uh, met on Tuesdays, as I stated, for a re-entry committee. 
and, and really those three meetings each week uh, are really focused uh, for the most part on the re-entry process. Uh, however, there are still some things that we need to talk about it as, a, as an administrative team outside of just planning for school. Uh, but you can see that you know the administrative team has been working uh, quite hard and, and diligently over the last uh, few months. On uh, Tuesday, July 21st, uh, during our re-entry, re reopening committee, uh, we did invite uh, parents and teachers uh, to start joining that committee. Uh, we got some uh, invaluable feedback from those stakeholders, and you know we truly appreciate their efforts and in, in all of their feedback that they did give. And we will continue, uh, you know soliciting that that feedback from those stakeholders. Uh, we've also participated in weekly, on average weekly, some weeks it's it's more, some weeks it's less, but on average weekly Zoom conference calls with the commissioner uh, where they're providing uh, updates and guidance as we go. Uh, obviously we do have our safety supply guidance that was sent out on Friday, June 5th. We also, as I stated, have that initial fall reopening guidance that was sent out on June 25th. Uh, there was some updates to fall reopening plans on July 10th. And Mr. Swenson has sent out, as you know, several correspondences, uh, you know, this past summer, one being on June 26th, one being on July 7th, and the other being on July 11th. And he will continue to do so throughout the summer. But if you have any questions about anything that has been sent out, certainly feel free to, uh, you know, search the website and you'll be able to access those or go back and check your email uh, because many of those correspondences that he's sent out have been in email form. Um, and then also Mr. Swenson provided an update at the July 15th school committee meeting, and we will continue to do so. Anytime we uh, can provide information as it becomes available, uh, we certainly will you know, continue to do that. Uh, just from the health office, uh, our nursing leader, uh, Ms. Claire Grennan, uh, has been uh, phenomenal in being very proactive, uh, putting out information to the administrative team and, and is starting to develop information for us to share uh, with parents uh, when they're, you know, they're thinking about the fall return. Obviously, at the forefront is, you know, being aware of those COVID-19 symptoms, such as the cough, the fever and chills, muscle pain, shortness of breath, sore throat, loss of, loss of taste or smell. Um, so that those, those are key uh, for you as, as family members, community members, but also for us as staff members to be on the lookout, uh, not just for ourselves, but also for our students and colleagues. Um, you know, we're relying on uh, mitigation strategies. Uh, which is obviously that daily monitoring starts with that daily monitoring for symptoms. You know, they're, they're right now, uh, it, it's not recommended that we do temperature checks or, or initial screenings when students or staff come into the building. So we, we really are relying on parents to be that first layer of defense at home, checking your students each and every day, uh, asking them how they're feeling. Uh, you know, if, if anybody, you know, is not feeling well or showing some of these uh, symptoms, uh, certainly to seek out medical attention and, and obviously to keep your you know your child home. Uh, but in addition to that daily monitoring, obviously wearing a mask, uh, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit more in terms of who's required to wear a mask. Social distancing uh, is, is certainly key, as is frequent hand washing uh, and sanitizing. Uh, and again, some of our classrooms are set up with sinks. Uh, we obviously have the restrooms where we do have sinks so students can engage and will be required to engage in frequent hand washing. Uh, but they have also said that if hand washing is not available, at the very least, students should be using hand sanitizer and also our staff members as well, not just our students, but our staff members as well. Um, and then obviously, if we have any students or staff that are you know, immunocompromised or medically involved, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly asking everybody to be proactive this summer to consult and collaborate uh, with your child's medical team or your family's medical team uh, to determine, you know, the appropriateness of, of in-person school attendance. Um, obviously, we'd like, you know, do you have that follow-up communication with the school nurse, provide them with supporting medical documentation so that we can go ahead and, and make sure that safe, effective plans are in place. And then um, also to be able to, you know, have that open communication with those medical teams uh, to be able to provide them with what the school is doing. So really those open lines of communication, I think, are going to be key as we go through this. Obviously, uh, in addition to those proactive strategies, we will be, you know, providing training uh, for our staff in terms of signs and symptoms of COVID-19, uh, what type of mitigation prevention strategies we can put in place. Um, uh, such as mandatory prevention techniques uh, in the use of PPE. Uh, all staff will be wearing masks. They will be social distancing. Uh, and again, staff, just like students, will be engaging in frequent hand washing uh, or hand sanitizing if, if washing is not uh, readily or immediately available and also monitoring for symptoms as well. 
um, you know, any any staff member that will have uh, close contact, uh, you know, for if, if they're direct service providers or, or what have you, uh, they would have close contact with students. They will be wearing additional PPE, such as face shields, gloves, and gowns. Um, our school nurses, um, are, who also will be wearing those those extra layers of PPE, um, will you know assess any type of ill student or staff member uh, that may be displaying COVID nineteen symptoms. And obviously, you know, placed in a medical waiting room uh, for immediate dismissal uh, so they can go ahead and seek medical attention outside of school. And obviously, our, our main goal here, like we've said from the get go back in the spring, is your child's safety, obviously, our staff safety, and in our community uh, as a whole. We want everyone to be safe, healthy, and well. And that continues to be our main focus as we go. Um, but please, you know, like I said, those open lines of communication are, are essential. I do want to just kind of get into, uh, you know, the, the possible models uh, for the fall that we have explored and we will continue to explore uh, over the next few weeks. The first one is a full return to in-person schooling with modifications. Now, those modifications have been outlined by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and we've used those to go ahead uh, and, you know, examine this first model to see if it's feasible for us to go ahead and, and fully return to an in-person model. Now, I'm going to share some of these modifications with you. These are certainly not all of them, uh, but these are some of the highlights. Uh, it's certainly in that initial guidance, uh, you know, there are additional ones that you, that you can go ahead and find in there. Um, but obviously the main one right now, uh, students need to remain three feet apart. Uh, the the um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is using that three foot bubble uh, as a minimum. And so when we're doing our site assessments, we're using that as the minimum, just because that's giving us some clear information in terms of you know how many students we can safely fit using that three foot uh, bubble uh, as we refer to it as. Um, students in kindergarten and first grade currently are strongly encouraged to wear a mask. Students in grades two through 12 and all of our staff members are required to wear a mask. Now, certainly uh, if any one student staff has a medical um, condition that prevents that or a behavioral uh, a condition, there's certainly you know, accommodations will be made. Uh, but again, that would require those open lines of communication between uh, families and school. Uh, and then obviously students and staff, as I've already stated, are required to engage in, in hand washing or hand sanitation multiple times throughout the day. Arrival, before eating, before and after taking off a mask and prior to leaving. Those are some of the, the key times and, and we're certainly going to encourage as much as possible uh, hand washing and hand sanitation above and beyond that uh, when feasible. And as I've already stated, again, these are just some of the modifications. I, I would certainly encourage you to, you know, to pour through that uh, commissioner's guidance from the 25th uh, for all the modifications that actually need to be uh, put in place. But these are some of the key ones that I wanted to share with you today. So really what we've done uh, over the last two weeks and, and really even going back further is, uh, you know, we've taken a, taken a look at our, our site classrooms buildings to see what we can use using DESE's best practices for classroom setup, which include physical distancing. So again, you know, aiming for that six feet, but using three feet as the minimum. And that's edge to edge. So when you look at seat edge to seat edge, it's not three feet from the middle of a student to the three feet to the, you know, the next uh, student uh, sitting next to him or her or the student in front, it is seat edge to seat edge uh, going in any direction, which I'll show you in a diagram in a minute. They are requiring all students to face the same direction. So this is really kind of limiting uh, the number of students that we can fit into a room. And again, I'll kind of go over that information. Uh, we obviously want to allow uh, teacher space. You know, the teacher does need to be able to move around in the front of the classroom um, and have a safe space to move back and forth along along the front. Uh, you know, so he or she can can go ahead and, and teach. We, we really looked at all of our classrooms and, you know, removing any non-essential furniture because our goal right now is how can we fit as many students as possible safely within a classroom using, uh, you know, the restriction of, of three feet as a minimum. And so that's required us to take out, um, you know, any additional furniture, bookcases, small instructional spaces such as tables, um, you know, some of our classrooms at the lower levels have reading nooks. All of those uh, at this point have, have been removed. Uh, student computer tables have, have also been moved. So we've, we've taken out student computers out of classrooms. Again, with the goal right now is to be able to fit as many students um, back, into a, back into a classroom. We've also looked at our communal areas. Uh, so again, looking at our larger spaces, such as our libraries, our gyms, our cafeterias, uh, if, if a particular building has an auditorium or a lecture hall, 
we've looked at those spaces as well. And what you're going to see uh, when I kind of start sharing more detail about the, the space assessment is that we have had to go into uh, some of those spaces. But there are some other restrictions uh, that we've also had to look at as well. Um, you know, immovable furniture in some of our classrooms, we have uh, furniture that's already fixed to the wall that can't be removed or fixed to the floor, such as science tables in some classrooms, uh, because they're, you know, in, in some of our buildings, they're pre-piped with water or gas. Uh, we've had to take into account the fire egress, which certainly, uh, you know, is, is of the utmost importance, you know, for any type of, uh, most of our classrooms obviously have one door, but many of our classrooms have, have multiple doors uh, to an adjoining room. And so we've had to leave an egress uh, so that you can access really any entrance or exit uh, in, in the event that, uh, you know, students have to uh, evacuate a classroom. So that's also kind of factored into that our space assessment uh, and, and you know quite frankly um, you know that's a row of desks that we could possibly fit in uh, but that you know we've now had to make sure that we're you know leaving open so here's an example uh, from the department of elementary and secondary education and what you'll see in this example is that they can actually fit 32 individual desks we uh, do not have any learning space in our district where we can go ahead and fit 32 individual desks in, in terms of our typical average classroom. Um, you know, we do have a few spaces that are a little bit larger um, and, and we can fit more, but certainly uh, not on a consistent basis. However, what you'll notice in this classroom is that there is a, a six foot teacher space up in the front of the room. Again, that's where the teacher desk would be. Uh, typically, most of our classrooms, that's where your uh, interactive whiteboard is or, or whiteboard. So that's that's the teacher space. And uh, then you can see in this particular model, you see three feet between each student seat, either going you know sideways across the room or you know from front to back as well. What you don't see in this classroom, though, is is space left for egresses. So this is, I guess, I guess you know, an average classroom that maybe only have one has only one entrance at the front of the room. However, as I stated, most of our classrooms have multiple entrances, so we've had to leave, um, you know, at least one, possibly even two, egress spaces, so that students can safely enter and exit should they have to. So in, in most cases, we, you know, we are not able to go ahead and fit as many desks as this model has in there. Um, some of it is due to the size of the classroom and some of it is obviously due to the setup uh, using that three foot model. So again, you know, so, so when we've looked at that full in person uh, return with these modifications in place, here are some key takeaways. Uh, classroom sizes vary throughout the district and, and really with the, even within a building. Uh, all of our buildings use a variety of different size furniture. Um, and again, even at the same building, uh, we, you know, depending on the grade level, you're gonna have diff different size furniture. Some classrooms don't have desks, some classrooms have tables. And typically, you know, when you look at a table, we can fit on average uh, roughly six students at a table, um, you know, two facing each other and then two on each end. Now, given these modifications where every student has to be at least three feet apart and all facing the same direction, a table that once fit six students now uh, we're really down essentially to one when we've set up some of these mock classrooms so you can see why you know we're having some um you know c capacity um, issues in terms of fitting all of our students and i'll get into a little bit more detail about what each site looks like but on average um, high school we're, we're looking at being able to fit 18 students up to 25 at the williams and again that's assuming that we've removed um, any type of extra furniture, student classroom, computers, small group tables, bookshelves, et cetera. Um, we will need to use communal spaces in some buildings. Um, so that does mean right now, uh, given our current staffing levels, uh, given our current student uh, you know, numbers, projected numbers for next year, in some of our buildings, we are gonna have to go ahead and, and hold classes in the cafeterias, libraries, auditoriums, computer labs, if we go with a full, uh, full in-person return to school. So you can see here uh, average class size compared to the average number of students that we can fit safely into a classroom. So at the high school, again, depending on uh, the grade level, the content area, average class size is 27. The high school can accommodate 18 students uh, using that three foot bubble right now. So you can see we can't fit all of our students into a classroom if we were in a full return of in-person. At Bridgewater Middle School, uh, we can fit, uh, I'm sorry, the average class size for seventh grade is 37, 33 for eighth grade. Um, so, you know, correspondingly, we can fit 25 students at the Williams and 18 at the high school. As you know, our seventh and eighth grade is split 
currently. Um, and so again, you know, we're not able to fit all of our students in our classroom with our current staffing and obviously our current projected enrollment. And just to, you know, remind everybody, obviously, uh, because of the, uh, you know, the financial uncertainty, uh, we did have to non-renew uh, 64. Uh, unfortunately, 64 of our non-professional teaching status. So we are down quite a number of teachers. Uh, obviously, our hope is to uh, be able to bring back some of those teachers, if not all. Uh, but again, because we don't have a state budget yet, we don't necessarily know what our, um, our state funding is going to be. So right now we're operating under the assumption that, um, you know, these numbers are based on not having those um, 64 teachers back. So that's why your average class size in, in some cases is, is higher than what you would expect. Um, you can see RMS, 27 students, average class size, we can fit 24 in a class. Williams, average class size is 30, we can fit 25 in a class. La Liberty, average class size is 28, we can fit 24 in a class. And the Mitchell is 30 and we can fit 24. And then Merrill, the average class size is 25. We can fit 27 in our kindergarten rooms and 24 in our first grade rooms. So you can see in, in, many, of, in many of these buildings, we are gonna have to um, use communal spaces. Um, so it's, it's something that's gonna happen at uh, all levels, whether it's the high school, uh, whether it's down at uh, our lower levels at the Mitchell, uh, I can tell you at the Merrill School, we're looking right now at, uh, of moving cafeteria tables into the classrooms to instead of having to move the students to the cafeteria. So we're, we're, we're looking at all different options. But again, if we go to a full return to in-person schooling five days a week, these are the situations that we're going to be presented with. And obviously, they're going to be challenges. And we realize that in many cases, having, uh, you know, three classes of kindergartners in the cafeteria at Mitchell uh, is not an ideal learning environment. And so, you know, that's something that we're struggling with. Uh, if, if, this is, if this is the choice uh, that we go with, uh, you know, that is gonna be reality. Uh, that, that does mean, you know, looking at the high school numbers, we are gonna have large classes in the lecture halls. We're gonna have classes in the library. We're gonna have classes in the gym. Uh, many of these situations, uh, you know, requiring us to have classes in those spaces. So again, that's if, if the final decision is a full return to in-person schooling, with the modifications that have been put in place, that three foot bubble right now, currently it's three foot, um, this is the situation that we're faced with. So you can see it's not not, a, not ideal in some cases, uh, there are some pros to it. Obviously we get all students back in the building. We do believe that you know that's the most effective model from a teaching and learning standpoint, because we do have all students in, in front of our teachers. Um, you know, the students would be back together, so they, they would have that socialization. And obviously you know uh, the benefits of that. So from a social emotional standpoint, uh, this is certainly uh, would, would be beneficial. And obviously, you know, we realize that, you know, there, there may be some academic gaps just given the spring, the situation from the spring. This is the best way for us to go ahead and provide those direct academic and social emotional supports. Obviously some of the cons to this, um, you know, in terms of mitigating the spread of COVID-19, we'll have the majority of our, uh, we'll have all of our students and all of our staff back in. Um, we are not able to fit um, all of our students into classrooms, so we will be looking at those communal spaces. Um, and, and like I said, that we know that's not an ideal learning environment. Um, you know, looking at, um, we, we got some recent guidance on transportation and certainly uh, looking at that new guidance, we're, we're not able to, uh, you know, have a full capacity bus. So now we know transportation costs are going to increase uh, because we potentially may have to run additional runs, uh, additional routes throughout the day to get all of our students in. Um, lunch is going to be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, they're, you know, advocating for lunch in the classroom right now. And as we, I just stated, we've set up our classrooms to get the most students in there as possible using that three foot bubble. However, during lunchtime, students would be obviously be taking off their mask. And the state is saying that when you do eat lunch and you have your mask off, you should be six feet apart. So we have to get creative there. That's gonna, uh, again, present a little bit of a challenge for us if we are in a full in-person return to school. And then, you know, obviously arrival dismissal, moving students around the building when you have a full school, uh, you know, those times can be challenging. You have a lot of students in the hallway, possibly at once or at arrival, uh, dismissal coming and going from the building. So in order to maintain that social distancing of three feet minimum right now, that would be a challenge for us. 
Um, hybrid learning. So hybrid learning, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this is a combination of in-person learning as well as remote learning. And uh, so again, I'll kind of get into a little bit more detail about what that looks like. Uh, but for any set given amount of time, a group of students, uh, you know, I'll just use uh, round numbers of 30. So if we have 30 students um, in a particular classroom for this school year, you can basically, you know, wrap your head around if we divided that class in half and, you know, 15 students were at home at any given time, 15 students were in front of a teacher at any given time, and then those students would switch. Now, there's a, you know, a additional layer to that, which I'll talk about in a minute. So instead of really having two cohorts of students, uh, we're really going to end up with three. And I'll explain how that will work. Uh, but the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is really asking us to look at um, our high needs subgroup. So our, our third cohort would be made up really of those high needs students. And I'll kind of uh, walk you through exactly uh, who will be in that subgroup. But right now we're, we're looking at our English language learners and our substantially separate students, uh, and, and obviously some additional students, students that may not have access to technology or may not have access to Wi-Fi that cannot engage in remote learning. Uh, those students, uh, it's, it's being advocated for right now, would attend school uh, every day each week. So they would not be in an alternating cohort. They would be in uh, school in front of a teacher each day um, every week, uh, to the extent possible. Obviously, we have to finalize that model um, and what exactly that will look like. But that is our intent right now to have that group, that high need subgroup in front of a teacher as much as possible. And then so once that uh, cohort is established, we would then take the remaining students, divide them into two, two cohorts. And again, they would alternate weeks or days of in-person learning. So for example, you know, cohort A is in front of the teacher, cohort B is remote learning, and then they would switch. And I will you know, kind of give you some uh, possible models in uh, a few slides. Just to talk a little bit more about those cohort C students, just to try to explain. Again, so DESE guidance is saying that our students that are most vulnerable or require uh, the, the greatest amount of assistance and support, we should really look to include them in school, in person as much as possible. So this, uh, you know, this is some of our special education students who, you know, through the IEP process have been placed in our substantially separate classroom programs, um, our preschool students, our preschool special education students, some of our students who are classified as homeless, who may be in foster care or in congregate care. And then obviously some of our students uh, who are English language learners. And certainly when you look, depending on, you know, say for our English language learners, it may not be all level of, of ELL students. It might just be level one, level two, or level three, uh, may not include level four, level five. Um, and again, looking at some of our students that, uh, who may be economically disadvantaged, who uh, may not have, like I stated before, access to technology. They would be considered our cohort C students and they would come to school as much as possible, depending on the model, depending on what that looks like. Our hope and our intent is to get them in front of a teacher as much as possible. So again, you know, hybrid learning, uh, you know, th this does, it, it presents several questions that we really have to work through. Um, and, and this is where, you know, the greatest level of attention is, is going to be given. You know, so what are the students doing at home? Uh, you know, so really when we look at that at home piece, you know, you think thinking back to the spring, because that's kind of, you know, the, the at home piece is very much like remote learning. And so we want to make sure that we have, uh, you know, a, a very structured, robust program uh, that goes above and beyond what we certainly rolled out in the spring. That was more of an emergency situation. This is now, unfortunately, more of our new norm, I believe. And so we want to make sure that we really are providing, uh, you know, the, the best educational experience, whether it's in person or at home, that we can. Now, several things that we're looking at, it, it, it could be very much teacher created like it was in the spring or they may be an online platform that our students would engage in. And that's something that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is also looking at, rolling out an online platform that all students across the Commonwealth may be able to engage in while they're at home, whether it's you know as part of hybrid learning or possibly as, as part of a full remote uh, learning experience. So once we have more information on that, we'll you know, know better which direction we're gonna go in, whether it would be a online platform or uh, be our teacher created. And uh, truth be told, it could be a combination of, of both. You know, because the other challenge that we have is, you know, while the students are in front of the teacher, 
Um, who's teaching those students at home? The, you know, obviously the teacher can't be in two places at once. And, and there's certainly ways to get around that. However, we are not set up right now, uh, nor do we have the means to, to set ourselves up and to go ahead and you know be able to live stream from every classroom. Certainly a teacher can be in front of a computer, uh, but if a, if a teacher is you know moving around the classroom, students at home uh, would not be able to see him or her. And then certainly we want to make sure that if you know this teacher is up in front of the board, uh, you know that a laptop would be able to to you know capture uh, that learning that's going on. And, and we don't really believe that that would happen. So it's a little bit different than a teacher being in front of of a computer uh, but right now that teacher can't be in two places at once so that's why we're we're working on that you know what are those students doing when when they're at home um and, and so we you know we will either have some type of dedicated teacher created program or really an online platform but again we're, we're vetting through that as we go uh, but we do know that you know hybrid learning and uh, certainly remote learning is going to you know require the greatest amount of thought and planning and the reason why I say that is, you know, a full in person, uh, the, there's more logistical things there to work out. Um, but that gets all of our students back in the buildings who are using all of our teaching materials. You're in front of a teacher. Uh, and, and so that's why I say hybrid and remote learning uh, will require the greatest level of thought and planning uh, in order to provide that successful teaching and learning experience. So here's some possible hybrid models. Uh, and again, you know, we're, we're sharing this with the community because, you know, we're we're, we're we welcome feedback. Um, you know, there has to be obviously with a hybrid model, uh, an in-person and a uh, remote or at-home scenario. Um, and you know, I, I think we would all agree we, we have to find the one that works best uh, operationally. We have to find the one that works best instructionally, and then also one that you know works best for our our families at home. And, and to do that, we, we've you know looked at several different models. Uh, the first one right now that um, you know is gaining some some traction to to really be strongly looked at would be a combination. Um, we didn't and and we'll share a a model where students are at home for a week and in school for a week. The problem, uh, you know, one of the pros and cons of that model, not to get ahead of myself, is you know you go a whole week without potentially seeing students. A model such as this, uh, you get the best of both worlds. So students are still you know engaging in remote learning, however they are in front of the teacher part of the week. So right now, uh, one possible scenario, and we'll just start with cohort A. Uh, cohort A would be in person Monday and Tuesday, and then they would be remote Thursday and Friday. I will speak about Wednesday in a minute. Cohort B would be remote learning Monday and Tuesday, and then they would be in person Thursday and Friday. Cohort C in this particular model uh, would be in person Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Now on Wednesday, all students, so the majority of students in, in from co all students from cohort A and cohort B would engage with the teacher Wednesday morning. Some of our cohort C students would still attend school Wednesday morning. They would still come, so they would get five days of in-person. Not all of our cohort C students uh, would, would fall into that category. But for example, our substantially separate students, they may come five days um, in the morning. And then Wednesday afternoon, students would be, uh, you know, given assignments to do. And Wednesday afternoon, our teachers would be engaged in remote learning planning. Obviously, uh, you know, planning for uh, remote learning does take, uh, you know, quite a bit of time. And so we want to be able to be mindful. That gives our, our teachers um, that time to go ahead and, and, and plan out those remote lessons, those remote learning experiences, um, and also gives them time during the week to be planning for, you know, in-person teaching. Uh, so that that's a combination of in-person and remote learning. Uh, and again, you know, there are some obviously, um, you know, pros and cons to that. The, the pros is that, you know, we are in school all of the time, which is uh, each week, not all the time each week, but certainly each week you're seeing you're seeing a teacher. Another possible uh, model, which I had mentioned already, was that you would have cohorts alternating weeks. So cohort A would be in person Monday through Friday on a given week. Cohort B would be remote. Cohort C would be in person, uh, and they would be in person for each of these alternating weeks. And then on the other week, uh, it would flip so that um, cohort B was now in person, and then cohort A would be remote. Um, again, Wednesday afternoon uh, would still be a um, half day um, for all students. So students would be getting out and just coming to school if they're in person, in person for the morning, and then there would be teacher planning time in the afternoon on Wednesdays. So that's an, another possible hybrid model. 
Some pros and cons to a hybrid model that we know. Uh, obviously, uh, you know some of the pros. We we know it allows for greater social distancing. Uh, there are less students in the class, uh, so we can spread them out uh, further. Um, you know the the day-to-day it, -day operations. Again, you're not having as many students at arrival and dismissal at lunch and specialists. So operationally, uh, it would be easier to run on a hybrid model. Um, and then all students would still receive in-person instruction. The cons, we understand that this is, you know, somewhat uh, disruptive to working families, depending on your profession. Um, this does require extensive professional development and obviously planning time uh, for our teachers to make sure that we have a more robust learning experience for our students than they had in the spring. And, um, you know, we, we obviously understand there's some challenges there to maintaining, uh, you know, coherence between the in-person learning experiences and those students uh, than, than what they would have at home. So again, you know, some pros and cons to those models uh, that we, you know, we truly understand. In both of these scenarios, uh, in, in model one and in model two, so model one is the full in-person return, model two is the hybrid return. We still may have some families that elect to engage in remote learning. They just feel as though it's not safe for their student to come back to school at this current time. So they will have the opportunity to engage fully remote due to their concerns related to COVID-19. Um, this, just to you know, clarify, remote learning is not currently the same as homeschooling. Homeschooling, you actually, your student is withdrawn from the school district. The school district assumes no responsibility for educating your student. That responsibility falls on the families at home. So with homeschooling, it's basically in effect uh, that you are withdrawing your child from school. Um, and, and it, you know, it, it, in many ways to, to kind of keep it simple, it, it's almost like you've moved away from the district. Um, because again, you know, there, there is a process in terms of uh, submitting a letter of intent, having your homeschool program approved, and then submitting progress reports at the end. But in terms of uh, any additional involvement from the school district, uh, we do not assume any responsibility for educating. So we don't provide curriculum to families. Uh, we do not provide uh, teaching support uh, to families in, in general. So I, I just, you know, some families uh, right now are using that term remote learning and homeschooling interchangeably. And I just want to be clear that it's not homeschooling is, you know, the responsibility of the home for schooling where remote learning would be, you would still be a Bridgewater Rainham student, you would still be engaging with Bridgewater Rainham students, uh, and, and in many cases staff, uh, but you would just be learning at home. So what we're in the process right now of developing is a remote learning plan um, that would allow our students to remain a BR student. They would be able to learn in a virtual classroom and they would stay connected with other students in our district. And as, as I've mentioned before, you know, th this remote learning, um, you know, this remote learning plan could either be uh, be our teacher created, be our teacher led, or it could potentially be, uh, you know, some type of online platform where students are engaging uh, in independent lessons. We're, we're still waiting to see what the state will roll out for an online platform. We've done some research and we've met with some vendors to see what other online platforms are out there uh, but again until we you know we have a a model from the state we're really waiting to make a decision on on what that will fully look like but there are many benefits to engaging in remote learning within the district again you stay you're a br student um, and you would still be connected and associated with the district you know, again, not like homeschooling where you're um, withdrawn from the school district and uh, you, assu you assume all responsibilities at home. Um, we, the one thing that we're going to ask is that if you do elect to um, take advantage of this remote learning opportunity, um, that you do take advantage for the entire school year. Although it's not required, it's just going to help us with planning purposes. Um, and certainly students, you know, have the right to uh, engage in remote learning and come back at any time. But in terms of uh, how we staff remote learning, uh, how many students are assigned to a remote learning virtual classroom, uh, you know, if we have students moving in and out, uh, it, it just won't allow for, uh, you know, that coherence and consistency. So just something to think about. We are going to respect, respectfully ask families that if they choose this option, that they do commit to remote learning for the school year. Uh, again, although that's not required, uh, we're just asking families to strongly consider that as an option. And then remote learning for all. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, we have to engage uh, in a full remote learning. 
this obviously is going to require some, uh, you know, instructional shifts. It, it, and, and again, this might be, um, you know, I don't anticipate us having to go to a remote learning uh, for all scenario. Uh, if there's not another spike, um, you know, space wise, we feel like we can uh, go ahead and mitigate the space issues by uh, looking at a hybrid model. Uh, some districts are not even capable of doing that. So some districts are still looking at possibly going fully remote uh, for some schools, some buildings uh, because of, of space issues for us right now. Uh, I, I, and again, this could change right at a moment's notice. But right now, you know, if, if we did have to engage in remote learning for all, more than likely it is due to a uh, spike again in the pandemic. Um, but what we do know is we are without a doubt will 100 uh, percent, you know, design a uh, remote learning um, you know, model that is, is much different than the one that was rolled out in spring of 2020. Uh, it will be more structured. It will be more engaging. Uh, there will be more, um, obviously, in terms of attendance, uh, there will be greater accountability. Attendance will be taken. Um, grades will be assigned. If you remember back in the spring, uh, again, the commissioner had uh, given guidance that uh, we should go to a credit, no credit grading system. Uh, that will not be the case uh, in this time around for remote learning. Uh, it will be graded. Um, and then, you know, if you remember back in the spring, there were some key uh, content standards or grade level standards that had to be covered. Uh, however, now, you know, the expectation is that we are forging ahead, uh, much like a, a traditional school year. So the expectation is that um, all content and or grade level standards will be instructed. And, you know, th this again, we're, we're really kind of trying to flush out what this platform will be. Will it either be a BR teacher led or created or will it be a platform uh, that's more independently led, but would have some type of connection to a, a BR staff member? Uh, possibly doing uh, check ins uh, with that student. So those are things that we're we're still vetting through. Again, pros and cons to a, a fully remote uh, model. Uh, we know from a, a public health perspective, this is the safest model. Um, you, in terms of know what to expect from a child care standpoint, there's not the back and forth. So there's consistency there. It's, it's every day at home. So you, you would know that. Um, again, there are cons. Um, we know it's not the, you know, the best model of instruction for most students, especially our high needs populations and, and even our younger students. Uh, this is going to require, you know, extensive professional development and planning time for our teachers. Uh, so, you know, in the, all those models, uh, you know, we realize uh, that, you know, that that is going to be the case. And, you know, obviously the equitable access to technology, not all, not all of our families um, have that equitable access. Uh, Mr. Swenson and the team did an amazing job in the spring. Uh, Mr. Shantz, our IT manager, and Mr. Swenson. Uh, and Ms. Morelli were, were diligent in, in, in getting all of our um, students that requested it, uh, some type of device to engage. But we certainly know that in many cases, uh, you know, that was one per household and we had multiple students. So, you know, we, we definitely have an equity issue there that, um, you know, creates a challenge, uh, but also uh, providing, uh, you know, the, for those equitable um, situations will be a budgetary strain. Um, and then, you know, obviously the, the lack of socialization being isolated from your peers, we certainly know that that's, that's not beneficial for the social emotional well-being of our, our students and staff. Just to kind of cover some important dates and uh, some next steps for you. Uh, on July 28th, this coming Tuesday, there will be another reentry committee meeting uh, with those parents and teachers and school committee members and administrators. Uh, so we will have an, an, another reopening meeting. Um, on Thursday, July 30th, there will be a reopening of schools um, hearing forum that will be streamed live on YouTube. Additional information uh, regarding that is coming out from Mr. Swenson today, so stay tuned on that, but that will be at 6 p.m. on Thursday. And then Friday, July 31st, we do have to submit a uh, tentative district plan to the department. And really uh, what that plan includes are many of the things that have gone over with you already today. It's really more about our site and space assessment. Can we fit students in? If not, uh, you know, we, we may have to look at a hybrid model. What are we thinking in terms of hybrid models for scheduling? Many of the ones that I shared with you today, and then what will remote learning uh, possibly look like? Will it be, you know, an online platform? Will it be teacher created? So we don't necessarily have to commit to anything at this point. This is just more fact finding on the Department uh, of Elementary and Secondary Ed's part. So we'll sum submit that um, tentative district plan uh, next Friday, the 31st. 
And then the final submission uh, right now is scheduled for Monday, August 10th. That is when we have to submit our full reopening plan uh, with the model that we will be going with. Obviously, it'll be uh, you know presented to the school committee and then uh, in turn submitted to uh, the department. Um, we are in the process of sending out additional family and staff surveys. Uh, be on the lookout for one tonight that's going to collect some additional information. And each survey that we send out may look a little bit different. Uh, it may actually look the same in, in some cases, but please make sure every time we send one out, even if it does look like the same inf information or questions, that you fill it out again because your mindset may change. And we want to make sure that we're capturing the most up-to-date uh, thinking from our families and our, you know, the most up-to-date intentions of our families as well. And then same thing for our staff. And then as we get more information, Mr. Swenson and I will certainly, you know, go ahead and share that and send that out as quickly as possible as it becomes available. And again, you know, we just ask that, you know, take advantage of all those correspondence that Mr. Swenson sends out. Um, you know, please make sure that you're reading through those. If you do have questions, certainly feel free to email us. Uh, you know, we will have our, um, parent form next Thursday night, uh, there'll be an opportunity for you to submit questions prior so that we can go ahead and be prepared to answer those. So you, you have many different uh, options uh, and, and possibilities here for giving your feedback. I'm just going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen for a minute. So give me one second. Okay. Great. All right. So again, Bridgewater Rainham, uh, I, I do want to thank you for taking the time to watch this. I know, uh, you know, no matter how it plays out, it's, it's somewhat lengthy. Um, it, we, we certainly try to keep them short and sweet as, as much as possible, but we know there's a lot of information in here to share with you. And so I do apologize for the length, but hopefully uh, if you're at this point, you've spent the time watching this and, and we do really appreciate this. Certainly at any time, like I said, feel free to email me email Mr. Swenson. Uh, we're happy to share our thoughts. And, uh, you know, we, we just, we, we want to be able to provide information to you as soon as we possibly can. We know many of our families are anxious about what the fall will look like. We are anxious about what the fall will look like. And as soon as we have information to share, we will be sharing it with you. So again, just lastly, I hope everyone is enjoying their summer. Everyone's staying healthy and well and safe. Can't wait to see our students. Uh, hopefully, it's it's in you know some form of in person, uh, whether it's a full return or a hybrid model. Um, I, I just think you know every educator in the district is, is really missing uh, having that that interaction with our students, and so we we can't wait to see them. Uh, if it turns out that it's uh, it's virtual, uh, that's better than nothing. Uh, but again, you know our hope is that we we see you all, our students, our families. Uh, sooner rather than later and just stay tuned stay tuned for additional updates uh, but again uh, on behalf of of mr swenson our superintendent uh, we just want to wish everyone uh, a continued healthy uh, and safe summer and uh, we'll see you all soon okay thank you very much